Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we will take our usual look at the calendar here. Uh, today is our 37th class. We have been covering velocity and total distance, and we will um, we will talk about all of this stuff together in just a minute. Uh, but looking ahead, uh, we've just had our third and final test, not counting the final exam. Um, I am going to hand you one more project. It is a project where you reflect on what you've accomplished this semester. I will hand that out when, I guess, Monday, um, and that will be due uh, when you start the final exam, okay? So the last project is going to be due at the start of the final exam. Uh, I will give you our last take-home quiz on Wednesday coming up, and it will be due the following class. Um, as you see, we've got four sections of new material left to cover for the semester. I've got one review day for the final exam. I've got a TBA day. I just kind of put that in there in case we have a snow day. I've got some flexibility in the schedule. So assuming we have no snow days, um, we'll have a couple of days at the end of the term for reviewing for the final exam. Mahendra. Our exam is surprisingly on Tuesday, December 20th. Yeah. Um, so uh, you can have a look at your schedule, and if you absolutely have a conflict and cannot do that date, then you can let me know. Um, but uh, yeah, our, our final exam is officially Tuesday the 20th, 8 until 10. Okay? All right, so you can see me outside of class if that's an issue. All right, um, so, 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 uh, let's just try to rehash what you guys have been working through with this activity here. So we had our zombies running their race again, and this time I gave you uh, velocity curves. Now, why was it easy to decide how far Feynman ran for the whole uh, race because his velocity didn't change and if the velocity doesn't change then maybe one of the most fundamental um, formulas in physics says that the distance is the velocity times the time right but it is harder to calculate distance when the velocity changes like for Hertz now there is an easy way to do Hertz's uh, graph because it's linear you can take a look at that spot right there and determine what Yeah, and so what was his average velocity was one mile per hour, right? Everything cancels, right? It works out perfectly. And so again, you can do the, you can basically just say distance is velocity times time, one mile per hour times five hours. Yeah, Ben. That's right. So her strategy was to start out fast and then slow down as the race progressed. But again, it's easy to find the average velocity. But uh, for Planck, no such luck. Does Planck have an average velocity for the five hours of the race? Absolutely. Is it easy to find that number? No way. It was really hard to find the average velocity for Planck's run. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's definitely something between, uh, what was the fastest he was running? Three miles per hour in the slowest. Zero. Took a brain a brain eating break or something at the bottom there. Uh, so the average velocity is something between zero and three, but can you confidently say it's 1.5? I can't. I mean, it's, it's really hard to calculate his average velocity. So instead what we do is make it so that we pretend he's running at constant velocities. And so for example, for the first half hour, assume that he stayed at three miles per hour the whole time for half an hour. Is that going to over or underestimate the distance he actually traveled in that half hour? It's going to overestimate because he wasn't running three miles an hour the whole time. But if we assume that he was running that constant three miles an hour, we can use our favorite physics formula. And, um, and when we say the distance traveled here, uh, velocity times time, so three times what number? Half. Right, half an hour. So <clears throat> one and a half what? Miles. Right. Uh, for for which, yeah, okay, so then, um, so looking at just this part of the parabola, it's actually pretty close to being a straight line, right? Like, it's not that curvy out there. And so, yeah, I like Levi's idea. If we just maybe estimate two and a half hours, we could get a pretty good sense of how far he, he really went. Yeah, great. Um, I think that's exactly what we end up doing. Um, when we, instead of looking in that first half hour and overestimating with the three, let's assume he was going the slowest he, he, he could possibly be going in that 
half hour. And so in this case, what's the distance? Two times the same half hour, which is one mile. And so he definitely didn't go as far as one and a half, but he went more than one. What's our best guess for how far he actually went in that half hour? 1.25, right, right there in the middle. And I think, uh, Levi, that's exactly what you'd get by focusing on that purple point right there. Yeah. Um, and so uh, here's a connection that I, I don't know that everybody got. Um, we said that the, uh, the distance for, uh, like for this black line up here was one mile. Multiplying two times a half is what geometrical thing for that rectangle? It's the area of that rectangle, right? It's the height times the base. And so said another way, the distance traveled corresponds exactly to the area of that rectangle. Now that rectangle is a pretty brutal underestimate from the, the true distance that he covered. How could we get a better estimate, a more accurate estimate, instead of doing half an hour? Quarter of an hour, or like a minute, right? Or a second. And so as these rectangles get smaller and smaller, thinner and thinner, the um, error that we introduce becomes less and less, right? And so the big conclusion of all of this is that if you want to know what the true distance traveled is, what geometrical thing are we talking about? What geometrical characteristic, like, will give us the exact distance traveled? Area under the curve. That's it. It's the area under the curve. That black rectangle is trying to estimate the area under the curve. But if I could somehow magically find the area of, and I'm going to try to draw this like extra, I'll exaggerate the curve there. It's not a trapezoid. But if I could magically find the area of that very strange shape, that would be the true distance traveled, right? Because that's what these like tiny little slivers of rectangles would eventually become. It would approach that. Okay, so that's the big conclusion. Um, which is here on this page. Uh, if we have a graph of velocity, total distance traveled is the area under the graph. Okay? All right, good. Okay, so let's uh, come together on this page right here. We'll do our demo now, page 56, 5, 6. Okay, so we are going to generalize what you just did uh, with those particular velocity graphs. And I will say that the notation here is kind of heavy, and so it might be a little bit painful, but just stare at it, uh, not just right now, but over the next few days, and hopefully uh, you'll get some clarity as to what all these symbols stand for. Okay, so here is our velocity curve, uh, just like the parabola we were looking at for Planck a minute ago, okay? So velocity is uh, some function of time. Okay, and so over here on the left, let v equal f of t be a non-negative velocity function on the interval a to b. What was the interval a, b in all of the zombie races? Zero to five, right? So we're just generalizing not zero and five, but a and b. And then we're going to cut the interval into n equal pieces. Now, initially, how many equal pieces did you do for that, like, step function? Five equal pieces, right? One hour each. And then for Planck, how many pieces? 10. And how long was each one? Half an hour. And so we're just generalizing, not five equal pieces, not 10 equal pieces, but n equal pieces, OK? And so what that means is that uh, down here on the t-axis, the horizontal, we're going to have n of these little points floating around here that just cut our interval up into n equal pieces. And so um, we've got t0 will be our first point, and then t1 and t2, and all the way up to t sub n will be our last point. Now, I just told a little lie. I said there were n points down there. How many points are there actually? They're n plus 1 because we've got the... We've got both endpoints that we're counting here. How many intervals down here? It's n intervals, but n plus 1 points. So for example, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? 6 points, but 5 intervals. OK, let's come up with a formula here for the width of each interval. We're going to call it delta t. Thinking back to the, um, the Planck example, the parabola, again, how many intervals? 10. How do we know they're half an hour long? What calculation do we do? Yep. 
the amount of time divided by the amount of intervals. How much time for the whole race? Five hours. How many intervals for the parabola? Ten. Five divided by ten, isn't that exactly how we get the half hour for each one? Okay, so it's definitely going to be a fraction we're filling in here. Downstairs was ten intervals for the parabola. Here, what letter for the number of intervals? N. Upstairs is the total amount of time. It was five hours for the zombies. It's got, it's got actually two letters in it. It's B minus A. That's it. Why was it five hours? Because it was five at the end and zero at the start. Five minus zero. You buy it? So the total distance from here to here. A at the left, B at the right. B minus A is how far apart they are. Okay, so we've got all of our symbols up here. Delta T is the name that we're giving to the uh, width of each of these intervals. In the parabola example, the delta T was half an hour. Half. Okay, so we can approximate the total distance traveled, which is the whole point of today's activity, which is the area under the velocity function. But we're approximating because we're using rectangles, which are sometimes rough approximations, by using left-hand sums or right-hand sums. To be clear, um, in the activity, I didn't ask for left or right. I asked for underestimates and overestimates. But for notation purposes, it turns out it's easier to just do always pick the left-hand point to draw your horizontal line. Like go to the curve at the left-hand point and draw your horizontal line. Or always pick the right-hand point and draw your horizontal line. So left-hand sum, here it is. The distance is approximately, okay, let's take a look at our first rectangle right here. Uh, left-hand sum. Between these first two points, which one are we picking for the left-hand sum? The left one, T0. That means we go up to the curve and we assume that however fast we were running there is how fast we're running for that whole little interval. And so the distance that I travel on that interval is just the area of that rectangle. It's the uh, height, which is the velocity, times the width, which is how much time. Velocity times time. Okay, um, the, what's the width called? It's a symbol. Delta T, that's what we're calling the width, just def defined to be delta T. What's the height right here? Well, it has to do with the function. Function is F. The input in this case is A, but we're going to call it T sub zero. So the height right here is just F, I'll put it uh, right here, F of T zero. Is that height? Do we buy that? And so the area of that rectangle is delta T times F of T zero. Yes? That is right there. Delta T, F of T zero. Let's move to the next interval. Again, left-hand sum, T1 or T2, which one are we picking? T1, so you go to T1, you go up to the curve, you say, I'm gonna assume that he was running that fast the whole time. And again, trying to find the area of that curve, which is how far we went in that interval, or it's an estimate, uh, what's the height? F of T1, what's the width? Delta T, it's always delta T, so then the area of that rectangle is width times height, delta T times F of T1, okay? And then we play this game all the way to the end, looking at the last two points, left-hand sum, which point do we pick? Tn minus one or Tn? We pick Tn minus one. In this case, it looks like an underestimate. And so the very last one here, very last one is f of which one? Tn minus one, which is right there, f of Tn minus one. Notice that which of those points on the x-axis uh, had no relevance in this calculation? T sub n, right? It does not appear anywhere because it was the rightmost point. And we just never, we never assumed that we were traveling at that velocity. Okay, so uh, areas of all these rectangles all added up gives us an uh, estimate of the distance traveled. Just as well, instead of using left-hand sum, we could use right-hand sum. Uh, only difference here, this very first rectangle, which point do we pick when we're doing right-hand sum? We pick T1. And so the very first thing is F of T1. I'm not gonna draw the other rectangle here, but um, well, I'll just draw one of these guys. Okay, so in 
that case, we get that calculation. And then in the next interval, which point do we pick? T2, which is there. In the last interval, which point do we pick? Tn, the right-hand point. We're always picking right-hand points. So that's there. According to the right-hand sum, which point gets no love? T0, because it's the leftmost point of the leftmost rectangle, and we just never look at it, right? But the idea here is that in both cases, we have how many rectangles that we're adding the areas of. It's n. It's n rectangles. In fact, it's almost exactly the same collection of n rectangles. The only difference is which one is the first and which one is the last. Okay. All right. Uh, number five says, what happens if the velocity function is negative, meaning maybe we're going backwards for part of our trip? Find the distance traveled between t equals 1 and t equals 4 using the velocity curve that's pictured. Uh, and then we'll answer a follow-up question about here. Um, okay, so between t equals 1 and t equals 4. So I'm just going to put there and there. Before we find distance traveled, let's just physically think about this person. So imagine I'm standing here on the x-axis right here on the ground. I'm going to put myself at 0 right now just as a starting point. In the beginning, my velocity is positive. Let's call positive to the right, so that way. Okay, so my velocity in the beginning uh, at t equals 1 is how much? four, let's call it feet per second, just to have some units, all right? So that means I'm heading to the right at positive four feet per second. What happens, like, you know, a moment after I start my trip at four feet per second? What happens to my velocity? It slows down. So I'm going to be going quickly and then slowing down, slowing down. What happens at uh, t equals three? Stop. Three seconds in, my velocity is momentarily zero. And then what happens for the last second? I start going backwards, faster and faster, right? Okay, so that's the idea here. So we've got distance and we've got distance. And what we know, Sam shared with us, the distance traveled is the area under the curve. And so let's go ahead and shade in area under the curve. So in this case, it's actually two different triangles. I'll put them in different colors. The distance traveled is the area under the curve. So forget rectangles. If we could just find the areas of those triangles, we win. This is one of those rare cases where we can do it without rectangles because triangles are easy. Triangles are one of the few shapes that we have an area formula for. Okay, let's find some areas here. Area here, what is it? Three times four, half of that, six is good. Half base times height. Area here. One, half the base times height. Okay. So uh, that's six. Again, I started here at zero. I started walking quickly and then slowing down until I stopped over here three seconds into the trip. What does that six mean? Traveled six meters or six feet. That is how far I traveled, yes? Did I? Oh, it's not, it's not six. Uh, four times two is eight half of that. So. Yes? Okay. You guys just want me to get a little more exercise. So again, walking this way for three seconds, slowing down, slowing down. I stop momentarily. How far have I traveled? Four meters or four feet, something like that. Right? Four two minus six. One half of three is one point five times four. No, but the one is considered a two. Yeah, it's not from zero. Oh. There we go. Okay. Got it. All right. Okay. So we said we traveled uh, four feet or four meters to get here. And then I go backwards, and how far do I go in this one second? I go one foot or one meter backwards. Okay, so then my total distance traveled, distance traveled is? The three? Distance traveled is five, right? The distance, tra don't shortchange me, I worked hard. Distance traveled is five, yes? Okay, but there is another word that also starts with D that has the answer of three. What is that other D word? Displacement. That's the other thing we want to know about. Okay, so the displacement in this case is uh, four in the positive direction, and then? 
and then a one in the negative direction. I'm going to put a plus just to kind of key in. I'm, I'm still adding. It just happens I'm adding a negative number. Any questions on that? Uh, how do we factor in our final with what you gave us already? Good question. All right, so let's let's talk about uh, let's talk about grades for a second. Um, all right, so first of all, uh, for uh, uh, your information, uh, the high grade on this test was 94. The median grade, remember that's if everybody lines up high to low. Person right in the middle is 72.5. 72.5 was the median grade. Okay, you're not in a competition with anybody else in the room but I just want to give you a sense of like the difficulty of this particular test. Um, so uh, if you are interested in knowing, you know, like what do I need to get on the final exam in order to get an A or a B or a C or a D, you can just see me right after class today or another day, and I'm happy to play with my spreadsheet and help you kind of narrow down what, what, um, where you are. Okay, so in terms of this test, so the... Um, the median being 72 and a half was lower than uh, than the medians on the first two tests. The medians on the first two tests were both 81. Um, now, I'm not surprised that the median on the third test is lower because the fact is the third test has the hardest material of the semester. The third test is the hardest of the semester. I'm not going to say the final exam is easy. It isn't. It's cumulative. But the final exam being cumulative means it's on everything, and there was some easier stuff early in the semester, and this hopefully, this is like a clean break, right? We're just starting a brand new topic here. It's not really related to anything that we've seen so far. Um, and so the reason the third test is hardest is that it's, it is like the culmination of all the stuff we've been doing with the derivative. And, you know, like uh, implicit differentiation can be challenging and related rates for sure. They're notoriously difficult in a calculus one class. Families of functions is tricky. There's a lot of A's and B's and X's floating around that problem, right? So you, you really do have like the hardest material being tested on uh, the third exam. Okay, um, that said, uh, some people had a significant drop on this third exam compared to their previous average in the course. And, um, and I'm going to recommend that some folks make a change in study habits. I know we've only got two weeks left, like literally like 13 days from now, this course is going to be completed. So, but I, but I still don't think it's too late to make a change. If any of what I'm saying here and anything in this handout I'm going to talk about in a minute resonates with you, then maybe it's not just a two-week change, but it's a change that you carry into your future semester, you know, 202 next semester, and maybe other classes next semester. Um, so uh, the, the reason I'm encouraging this change for some folks is that uh, I've got a lot of people that have near-perfect homework averages, but then test averages that are quite a bit, that are, that are just kind of low. And so, like, if you're getting 100 on the homework or, like, a 98 average on your homework and your test average is, like, a 70, I'm just going to throw a number out there, then there's a disconnect, right? Something that you are doing, the way in which you are approaching the homework is not connecting, it's not resulting in strong test grades. And so that's the disconnect that I'm trying to resolve. Um, and so uh, I've said this before, but the, the goal of everything that we do in this course is to learn calculus is to understand the concepts of this difficult field and that includes the homework and it includes the demos we do and the activities and the sample test problems and the projects and the take-home quizzes and the tests all of them have exactly the same goal and so it just appears to me that some of the things that i am asking you to do um, they aren't getting us towards the goal in the way that i want them to and, uh, and so again, that's, that's sort of what, why I'm, I'm recommending maybe a change. Um, okay, so I've got a couple of rhetorical questions I'm going to ask right now, um, but, um, but I'm happy to have your responses. If you <clears throat> find me outside of class, I would love feedback on this, but at the moment, these are just rhetorical questions. So uh, I have a homework policy where you can turn any homework in up until the day of the test. Some folks are doing homework regularly. Some folks occasionally get like a homework behind, but then they catch up pretty fast. But too many people are doing very little to no homework for the three weeks between tests and then doing 
almost all of the homework the day before the test. And that, uh, in my opinion, would lead to a very uncomfortable three weeks in a calculus class where you haven't been keeping up with the homework. And so I'm just wondering, is, is my homework policy encouraging some people? Like, I want to give you flexibility to do the homework when you're able, but I don't want to encourage folks to just say, oh, I'm just going to do all that, like to make it like the, the habit, the rule, I'm just going to do all the homework at the last minute because that's when it's due. Um, okay, uh, I give you guys reference sheets and I let you use your own reference sheet on the test. As a result, some people don't know the derivative of tangent. And I think that's a problem at this point in a calculus class. And the derivative of tangent is not hard. There's, there's only like a dozen derivative formulas that we've got, right? There's not that many. Um, but I'm just wondering if maybe my uh, use of reference sheets is making it so that folks feel like, well, I don't even have to bother memorizing these derivative rules because it's right there on the reference sheet. And if you have to look up like the quotient rule every time you use it, I think uh, your experience is not going to be as solid as it could be. And in particular, next semester in Calculus 2, when we go the opposite direction from taking derivatives, if you don't have these derivative rules down cold, I promise you it's going to be an uncomfortable time. And so I'm just thinking about my reference sheets. And again, is it, is it, is it maybe not helping in the way that I want it to? Um, uh, take home quizzes. Um, they're open resource, right? You can use anything you want except for another person. That's very far from the way that the tests are, are given, right? You, you have very few resources with you on the test. And so I, you know, like it's really efficient when you're doing a take home quiz to have the problem on the take home quiz and then go find something similar in the textbook or find something similar online. And that's completely legal according to the rules of the quiz, but isn't necessarily preparing you all that well for taking the test, right? And so, you know, like, Again, having these take home quizzes with all of these resources, I'm just wondering if maybe it's encouraging folks to like really have this disconnect between how they approach uh, quizzes and and how they actually do on tests. OK, so those are some rhetorical questions. But if you have feedback for me, I'd love to hear it outside of class. So let's wrap up here. Uh, there's a one page handout that I just put on everybody's table. It is an article. Go ahead and grab that thing. It is called Homework as Assessment. I encourage you to find the time over the next few days to read this article in its entirety. I'm just going to give you the thrust of the article right now. The article talks about treating homework in a very different way from how most students treat their math homework. It is going to propose uh, what sounds like very, very inefficient use of your time in terms of doing homework. But the results might be there. And uh, I'm not even going to say that if you try this, quote, less efficient way to do homework, that you're, you're therefore going to need to spend five times as much time as you are currently on homework. I'm not saying that. What I propose instead is that you take whatever time you have to allot to homework, just keep it the same. I mean, if you could do more, great, but keep it the same and just do less homework. Like try this less efficient way and just accept that on some homework assignments, you're going to get a one out of four or two out of four or whatever. The homework is worth peanuts compared to the test results. And maybe changing the way in which we approach the homework will have a strong, significant, positive effect on the test results. And that's what we're after here, OK? Um, all right, so like I said, the course is done in 13 days. The finish line is in sight. I, I, I'm a runner. I, I have like running analogies that, that I think about all the time. Regardless of how I have run a particular race, like maybe I run it really smart, maybe I run it stupidly and go out too fast, maybe I don't stay hydrated, I always want to finish strong and I always want to leave everything out there on the course. And so like my ideal race, which I have never had yet, would have me pushing it at 100% as I cross that finish line and then collapsing because I've given everything that I had. Right. And so I know that we're tired. I know some of us are sick, have been sick, will get sick. I know you've got lots of responsibilities for other classes and outside of GCC responsibilities too. whatever hidden reserves of energy you have. This is the time to draw on them and try to finish strong, regardless of where you are in this course at this moment. OK. All right. Thank you for listening. Um, again, I'm open, interested. I want feedback uh, outside of class. Find me today or another day whenever you can find me. We'll see you guys on Friday.